Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming out on this glorious day. We're in the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the two Mississippi museums. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. And if you have not already, please silence your cell phones. I note with sadness the death of a Mississippi hero, Unita Blackwell, the first African-American woman to be elected mayor in the state. She gave a memorable history as lunch years ago with Joanne Pritchard Morris on the publication of her book, Barefootin', truly a loss for us all. This will be the third weekend of the month, so on Saturday, admission to these museums is free. Members, of course, always enjoy free admission to both museums as well as our special exhibits. If you are interested in learning more about that, next to the email sign-up sheet and the schedule, you will find member brochures. The Great Big Yam Potatoes Old Time Music Festival will be Saturday at Historic Jefferson College, where museums from across the region will compete and perform. That's free, of course, and begins at 9 a.m. And I hope that you will join us next week for History's Lunch, when our speaker will be author and University of Michigan professor Stephen Berry, who will discuss his book, The Jim Crow Routine, Everyday Performances of Race, Civil Rights, and Segregation in Mississippi. Uh, Barry is a professor at the University of Michigan, and this program is made possible through a co-sponsorship with the Mississippi Historical Society. We're really looking forward to having him down here, and if you want to learn more about the Historical Society, go to mississippihistory.org. Today, we are delighted to have Lovejoy Boatler discussing his new University Press of Mississippi book, Crooked Snake, The Life and Crimes of Albert Leopard. Boatler spent his early years in Grenada County. He worked for the Mississippi Legislature, as a deckhand on the Mississippi River, and in a rodeo in Colorado. Butler has taught construction technology and instrumental music in public schools. He builds custom furniture. There's a wonderful quote from Governor Winter about this book, and I was prepared to read it to you until I saw that Lovejoy had also used it in his PowerPoint, as I would have as well. Rather than seal his thunder, I will only note that when I was looking on Amazon, at reviews of his book, it is the only nigh perfectly reviewed book I have seen out of 15 reviews, 14 or five star and one, sorry son of a gun, gave it only a four star review. <laughs> Help me welcome Lovejoy Buckley. Okay. There you go. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I really appreciate it. I appreciate the two muse museums having me today. And um, I wanted to clear up one thing from the, from the get-go, because uh, I always get this question, where did you get that name, Lovejoy? So I, I thought I'd just clear that up. My great-grandmother was Ida Lovejoy of the Lovejoy family. She named all three of her children, they had Lovejoy as a middle name, my mother had Lovejoy as a middle name. I have it. I have other people in my family. So I had students one time uh, who, you know, found out my name because often in teaching I would go, I was Wallace because that's my first name, said, uh, Mr. Butler, your parents must have been hippies. And I said, <laughs> I said, no, they were not hippies. My parents were not hippies. So, uh, all right, let me uh, talk about Crooked Snake. It began in 2003. I had been working on some manuscripts and I was not having a lot of luck. And my wife, Jill, sitting right there, suggested, why don't you write about that day you were kidnapped? And I thought, well, it would be interesting, but it would be kind of a short story. But I thought about it. And so I decided to find the scrapbook that my mother had made in 1968. I had not looked at it in years and years. And I found it, and I started reading those articles. I don't think I had ever read the articles in there from the Clarion Ledger, the Commercial Appeal. And it talked about one of the convicts who kidnapped me that day had, at that time, that was his fifth escape from Parchman Penitentiary, and he was considered an escape artist. So I just began to look into all of that. It talked about people who had been tied up and robbed and law officers on these manhunts. And I realized that what happened to me that day 
was a very small part of a much bigger story. What that story was, I didn't know. So I just began to research. And uh, I went to Newport. I didn't realize there was a town in Mississippi called Newport. But I found it and I went there and I began talking with people. Eventually I would compile 70 interviews, taped interviews, and I would come home and do the transcripts. And Jill thought, what are you doing? You know, this is, you know, she didn't quite, and I didn't quite know where all this was going either. But uh, so Crooked Snake is taken from these interviews. Uh, it's, taken from, it's taken from research. Uh, primarily at Archives and History, and then sworn statements that uh, had not seen the light of day since 1959. I found Albert Leppard and his cohorts, uh, not sworn statements, but statements to law enforcement after the crime that put him in parchment for life after that was committed in 1959. So that's, uh, that's Crooked Snake. And I'm going to go through a few slides here, and uh, just uh, I'll talk very, very briefly about that. Then I'm going to do a reading. I'll do a reading really starting at the, the, the first of the book, chapter one, and then I'll skip over to chapter 15, which is uh, my kidnapping, what happened. There's a whole lot that goes on between chapter one and chapter 15, like... Uh, four or five escapes from the penitentiary that you're, you're going to go through as a reader. Uh, okay, let's see if I can remember what Chris told me here. I think, yeah, here we go. So, yeah, this was, a uh, Governor Winter was kind enough to do this for me. Um, the, the Winters, our, our farm in Grenada County was just a very short distance from the Winters farm. So we, we've known them from that family from way, way back. And so he just, uh, he wanted to do this, growing up in Beat 4, Grenada County. The Boatler family of the Riverdale community were some of my closest neighbors. I remember well that steamy Mississippi summer day in 1968 when we learned of the kidnapping and subsequent release of 18-year-old Lovejoy Boatler by escaped Parchman Penitentiary convicts. In poignant yet captivating style, Lovejoy chronicles his harrowing ordeal on that sweltering afternoon with exquisite detail. Crooked Snake, this gripping account of Lovejoy Butler's kidnapping and his years-long quest to learn more about his captors is absolutely riveting. This is a long-awaited publication by this skillful writer and longtime friend not sure I can live up to all that, but I really appreciate it. Um, all right, I'm just going to kind of quickly work through some of these things. This was our farm in Grenada County. This was actually a map that my older brother Lee made in 1968. And um, that particular day, I was really down in the field on the southern end of the place along about right here. Here's Highway 51 that cuts across. Uh, here's the IC railroad line that runs all the way through here. And of course our houses were more up in this area here. So this is where I was that day by myself. In 1968, I had just graduated from high school that, that uh, summer, that spring. And this is the actual, this isn't the actual truck, but this is uh, very similar to our turquoise farm truck that I had to go to uh, Memphis with them in against my will. And of course, you know, just about everybody knows a soybean field. This is not our farm right here. I just, just uh, then some of you may have never actually been around soybeans that much, but that's the kind of field I was in, soybeans uh, plowing. This is the tractor I was on, a 4020 John Deere. It was, uh, for John Deere, that was a big tractor in the, uh, in the 60s. Very, very popular for at least 10 years. Kind of like the Ford Mustang was popular. The 4020 John Deere was very popular, and that was the tractor that I was driving that day. 
uh, with some plows attached to it. This is Giesland's Corner. Uh, as you know, I, I get into the story and read. I'm not sure if I cover this or not, but this is where the convicts pulled in and uh, they were going to rob this store. Actually, this store, uh oh, let me back up. The, uh, well, here we go. There we go. Now, the old corner store is, has, it's, it's a rebuilt store. Giesland's Corner was the old store that stood directly on this site. And uh, Mr. Giesland, an elderly gentleman, ran the store. So, all uh, right. And that is in Memphis. After we arrived and I was released and the uh, a detective is checking my fingerprints against fingerprints on the truck. I guess that's what he was doing. I think that is what he was doing. Um, okay. And here's in Memphis. Albert Leppard has been captured. It says FBI Saturday. The FBI said Saturday it may file kidnap charges against Albert L. Leppard, 33, and John W. Parker, 30, both escapees from a Mississippi prison. They were arrested in Memphis Friday evening after forcing a youth to drive them to Memphis in a pickup truck. Uh, photo shows Leppard serving a life sentence on conviction of his great aunt's death, being jailed after the arrest. So there he is in Memphis. And he's being led away. Boy, that is a big dude beside him there. <laughs> Look how big that gun looks. Man. But Leopard wasn't a... T he was about 5'6", five, 5'7", five, maybe. Not a big guy. Okay. After my kidnapping, after everything had the smoke had all blown over, a couple of weeks later, I was cleaning out the truck and um, found these two 1922 silver dollars in the pocket. All I could figure was that Albert Leopard had put them in there. I don't know why, uh, apparently for me, but it's always been a bit of a mystery there. My mother put them on this red felt and they originally were in a black frame and I've just, I've always had those. Um, okay, this is a letter in August, I believe, that I received, my dad received. Dear Sir, encloses application for reward in the case of Albert Lee Leopard and John Willis Parker. Please have your son, Wallace Lovejoy Butler, sign before a notary public and return to us. Upon receipt, we will forward to the executive department with our request for payment. We would also like to extend our compliments to your son on the manner in which he handled such a delicate situation. Sincerely, B.C. Ruth. I'm not sure exactly what it was that I handled, but uh, <laughs> anyway, you don't handle a whole lot when a gun's on you, but I appreciate what he had to say. Um, okay. And... This is Cineash Creek in Atala County, back in a very remote area. On the southern side of Atala County, there are big hills, and you can really get lost back in there on some of those roads. And so this picture was taken at a place very near Flowing Well, which was kind of a... Um, well, it was a place that Albert Leppard would hide out. And it almost takes on mythical proportions with some of the folks in Atala County who lived in that area. Um, but So that's Sinny Ash Creek. And I think maybe there's one more slide here. That is Albert Leppard in 1959 when he and his cousin murdered their great aunt. They tied her to her bed. They robbed her. They doused her in kerosene and set her on fire. So you can understand how a person who does something like that had his bluff in on just about everybody. Um, so that's, uh, that is Albert Leopard. And 
that's got to have been taken right, right when he was taken into custody. One thing that's always talked about about leopard, oh shoot, I keep hearing, setting the wrong thing. Let me, uh, da, 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 da. there it is right there. Well, anyway, I won't. Is his, his hair. His hair was always long and piled up, high on his head. Part of that on the left is shadow, but a lot of that is just hair on his head. He, he, uh, he really did, you know, he sure enough needed a haircut. But, uh, all right, so we will go back to the cover. As I said, I started uh, Crooked Snake back in 2003. Uh, I interviewed from 2003 to 2006 and uh, compiled it, got it all together. I had a couple of agents, New York agents along the way. They never could seem to get the book placed. And I finally uh, had just really honestly, I'd reached a point I would re- wished I'd just never gotten into all of that. But then University Press came along and they loved the manuscript, Katie Keene, and, um, and things began to move, and they wanted to publish Crooked Snake. So it, it has all worked out from there, and I'm very appreciative to, to them and just the team there with University Press. But I'm going to go ahead and do a couple of readings here, and, uh, and then we'll open the floor up to questions, if that's okay. And... Uh, as I said, I'm going to start with chapter one. Let me get my glasses on here. They're about half broken. Here we go. Now, chapter one, Jackson. I don't know how many people were kidnapped in Mississippi in 1968, but I was one of them. I was taken from my family farm that June by two escaped convicts from Parchman Penitentiary, John Parker, convicted of armed robbery, and Albert Leopard, sentenced to life for murder. I was sure I would die. Despite the terror of that event, I survived. My life has moved far beyond the bean field where it happened. I finished college, clerked for the legislature, worked on the river, was a rodeo hand in Colorado, had a family, built houses, taught school, and made music and furniture. But I've told this story at least once a year to most anyone who would listen. My wife, who has heard the account a hundred times, said I should, must, write it down. But I wasn't so sure. This particular slice of history ought to be told to wide-eyed kids around a fire pit on a moonlit night or to folks getting tipsy at a cocktail party before dusk. Being kidnapped was quite an oddity. In 1963, when I was 13, Frank Sinatra Jr. had been kidnapped for two days. I had a vague memory of that news because my parents talked about it around the dinner table. Patty Hearst was taken in 1974 by members of the Symbionese Liberation Army and would not be found for a year and a half. After her ordeal, the world became familiar with Stockholm Syndrome, a condition that causes hostages to develop a psychological alliance with their captors as a survival strategy. They were both 19 at the time of their kidnappings. Images of my abductors had slipped in and out of my thoughts for a long time in mean snippets of memory. Their ominous approach on our field road, the tense encounter, a revolver in my ribs, fear, commotion. Deep in the bottom drawer of an old walnut secretary in the living room was the kidnapped scrapbook my mother had made for me after I was abducted. She had been greatly disquieted by the whole affair. 
I tunneled under mounds of paper to exhume the musty relic. It contained photographs and news articles from the Jackson Clarion Ledger and the Memphis Commercial Appeal with a list of the convicts' crimes. Their defiant mugshots stared from the newsprint. Leopard's menacing, don't give a damn gaze was etched in my psyche and gave me a jolt. A grainy black and white photo of me holding my hands up as a detective examined my fingerprints shot me back to the scene of the crime. I was 18 years old. On the last page of the album was a letter from the penitentiary addressed to my father, a member of the state legislature, thanking him for the part I played in the capture of the convicts. It read, August 5th, 1968, Honorable E.L. Boatler, Riverdale Farms, Route 3, Grenada, Mississippi. Dear Sir, Enclose his application for reward in the case of Albert Lee Leopard and John Parker. Please have your son, Wallace Lovejoy Butler, sign before a notary public and return to us. Upon receipt, we will forward to the executive department with our request for payment. We would like to extend our compliments to your son on the manner in which he handled such a delicate situation. Sincerely, B.C. Ruth, Classification Officer. Parchman sent me a reward of $50, a remarkable sum for a Mississippi farm boy in 1968. I closed my eyes and let the memory of that uncommon time envelop me. The red-haired killer, hot wind through the truck, my brother's rifle, my pistol, their pistol, the long ride. I snapped out of it, focused on the present. I needed to find one more vital artifact, the pair of 1922 piece silver dollars leopard left me. My mother had carefully glued the coins on a rectangle of red felt and put them in a simple black frame. I rummaged around the house most of the morning, but to no avail. Frustrated and about to abandon the search, I reached up and felt around the top edge of a tall hutch. There they were, hidden away years ago for safekeeping, so secure they were almost lost. The coins were tarnished tokens with a worth to me far beyond their face value. Decades earlier, Leopard held these coins in his hand and for a strange reason known only to him, left them in the pocket of our farm truck for me to find. I've shown them to a few people, not many. The Clarion Ledger stated that Leopard held from Newport, a wild and rugged place in central Mississippi. A coffee-stained road map pinpointed Newport as a mere dot 70 miles northeast of Jackson. I debated the wisdom of going there, but the spark had been struck. Now was the time to unearth the life of this felon from my past. I fervently hoped to find other people who were, like me, his victims, tied up and robbed, abducted, or worse, and I would try to meet his family. The next morning, armed with the two silver dollars in my pocket, I hugged my wife, told her not to worry that I would be home for supper. And as she later said, I just took off. I departed for Newport with little fanfare, leaving the polite society of Jackson, aiming for a remote hamlet in the rough heart of Mississippi, where people most likely wouldn't take kindly to nosy strangers. Chapter 2, Newport. The truck rolled to a stop at the intersection of highways 14 and 429, far from any major thoroughfare. A green and white sign read, Newport. 
I was the proverbial stranger in a strange land, an interloper, but a man on a mission. I had arrived at this isolated spot 35 years after being kidnapped on the trail of my long ago abductor. There were no passing cars or stores bustling with customers, no strolling window shoppers or children riding bicycles, just two buildings, a church and a restaurant facing each other across an empty expanse of highway. A languid breeze blew out of the southwest, drawing moisture from a silvery lake. Surrounding the lake, a few rustic houses showed little sign of activity. Across the pasture, where the valley floor rose to meet the hills, a faint summer haze hung over a line of distant oak trees in the afternoon light, suggesting long-held secrets hidden in the forest beyond. Farther to the west, farther to the east, a gravel road forked south from the blacktop, flowing, winding into the hills. Partially hidden in a grove of pecan trees, a white frame house stood right off the gravel road. I drove up the ruts, scattering a flock of chickens and one rooster. The banny male was roaming the yard, pecking the slick ground and nosing a scattering of paper garbage. I opened the truck door, and the startled rooster chased his harem of hens under a flat-tired green Ford station wagon parked in the side yard. A mangy black dog hiding beneath the half-rotted steps growled at me. As I neared, he retreated further under the house, but kept up his low snarl. I walked up the well-worn steps onto the porch and knocked on the flimsy screen door. I heard the whisk of house slippers shuffling forward, too slow to be a young person. The door opened, and an elderly woman with cold, dark eyes peeked out. Her face was thin and worn, her hair flecked in gray. She appraised me. Can I help you? I hadn't prepared what I wanted to say. Felt awkward. I blurted out the first words that came to mind. I had a run-in with Albert Leppard, but I was young. There was a moment of silence. Well, bless your heart, come on in. <laughs> the acrid smell of day-old turnip greens emanated from a darkened room in the rear of the house. Johnny, she called, then took my arm and guided me to a threadbare brown couch in the small sitting room. Across the room, I was startled to see a bare-chested man wearing a green John Deere cap, faded jeans, and no shoes. He sat in a straight-back chair staring at me. I thought he might be her son. He never spoke. Johnny, she called again, this time more emphatically. A silver-haired man in khaki pants and a loose white shirt emerged from the dim hall and looked at me with mild wonderment. I shook his hand, introduced myself, briefly told my story, and asked if they might be willing to share what they knew about Albert Leppard. They looked at each other unsure of what to say. So I showed them the two 1922 silver dollars Leopard left me. Johnny reached for the coins, closely examining them as if they were ancient relics. Yes, we knew him, the woman said. She introduced herself as Margie Faye Hutchinson. Her sister, Betty Jean, was married to Ray Edwards. Albert Leopard's first cousin. She and Johnny knew all the Leopards. Johnny proceeded to name a few. There was Bilbo, Bilbo, Josh, and Otis. Them was all brothers that played fiddle and mandolin. Bilbo's son, Ernest, was gut cut in a knife fight and thrown in the Kosciuszko jail. 
He stuffed his intestines back into a foot-long wound and stitched himself up on the floor of the jail, somehow or other. Johnny added that after his release from jail, Ernest would proudly pull up his shirt and show that huge, ugly scar across his abdomen. He was a massive man, and like many leopards of that generation, Ernest liked to fight. You know, any normal human being couldn't have survived that, Johnny said almost reverently. That was a leopard for you, Margie added. Ernest once picked up a 500-pound bale of cotton using only his teeth. I guided the conversation back to Albert Leopard. <laughs> yeah. They told me he had a hideout in the deep woods, a secluded place called Flowing Well, where Margie once took him food when he was on the lamb for the law. She admitted her part in helping Leopard. I took it in one of them pie plates, cornbread, peas, and butter beans, and a glass of tea. I took that food over there. He reached out and got it, and I come to the house. I knew I was doing wrong by feeding him, but I'm not going to let a dog go hungry if I can help it. I might have to go to jail, but I sure fed him. Yeah, he loved iced tea. I sensed there was much more they could tell me about Leopard, but this was all they were willing to reveal. How did she know he was at Flowing Well? People told her, but she wouldn't say who. Johnny suggested I should go down the highway and talk to Bailey Hutchison. He made it clear that despite sharing the same last name, they were not related. Bailey could tell you a lot, he said, nodding. Margie added another note about Leopard. I never was scared of him, and honey, if he was to call me today, if he was living and sitting back there somewhere and didn't have food, I'd take it to him. People do have feelings for him, Johnny added. I thanked them for their hospitality, and as I stood to leave, I glanced into the corner of the shady room. The silent, half-dressed man's eyes followed me all the way out the door. Margie and Johnny Hutchison were my introduction to an eccentric world, one that would consume me for the next few years. But my immediate goal was to find Bailey Hutchinson and learn what he knew about the man who had once rammed a pistol in my side. Wow, time's getting on. Okay, I think I'm going to stop there, and I will move on to my uh, kidnapping, chapter 15. And uh, I won't read all of that, but I'll, I'll read a little bit of that. So, the book is moving forward. We've you know, gone through 14 chapters and a lot of escapes and a lot of crazy stuff. So, uh, anyway, here we go. Chapter 15, Riverdale Farms. And this is from the standpoint of me when I was 18 years old. So you'll have to pardon some of the language. So, anyway, Riverdale Farms, 1968. They saw me before I saw them. Most likely, they had been watching me for a while from the ditch next to the field. That day, June 22nd, was a typical summer day on our farm, hot and humid with a slight chance of rain. And by early afternoon, the temperature had risen to 95 degrees. My worn Levi's had melted onto my legs. Occasional dust devils danced across the path of the tractor, sending bits of dirt and grit swirling onto my face, adding to my misery. To pass the time and endure the grime, I sang Beatles songs to the mesmerizing drone of the diesel engine, like Nowhere Man or Help. Driving the big machine all day made me ache from head to toe, 
made me dream of places I would rather be. Just the week before, I celebrated my 18th birthday by signing up for the draft, that obligatory rite of passage, knowing all the while the jungles of Vietnam were no place for me. I intended to enter college in the fall, but my immediate plan was to water ski on Grenada Lake with a few friends. After a scorching day in the field, nothing promised to be any better than moonlit water, balmy night air, and a couple of cold beers, a brief respite from the Mississippi heat. In the meantime, my duty was to plow 40 acres before the sun turned red and sank below the horizon, before the air cooled and the cicadas began their evening chorus. Only then could I call it a day. Riverdale Farms was two miles from Grenada, in the north-central part of the state, on the Yellow Busha River floodplain. My family owned 853 acres, land purchased and cleared by my grandfather back in 1920. A clacking 100-car freight train rolls south along the eastern border of our farm, and at daybreak, the city of New Orleans passenger train rushed through, making its headlong run from Chicago to the Crescent City. Folks peered out to catch a glimpse of the waking countryside. On our farm, the telling of time was synchronized with the passing of the trains. It was now early afternoon. At the end of the row, near the highway, I turned the tractor in a well-practiced motion of reducing the speed, then raising the plows while simultaneously depressing the left brake. This caused the massive John Deere, I call Big Green, to pivot left in a pirouette as delicate as a ballerina's. Once it aligned with the return rows, I released the brake and dropped the plows to continue the monotonous mission of finishing before late afternoon. It was then I saw the two men. They were trudging up our field road. Probably fellows headed for Miss Garner's place, two miles north. This didn't happen often. In fact, I couldn't remember anyone during my 18 years ever traveling on foot through our fields. I held the tractor steady in the middles, glanced again, and had to make a decision. Stop the tractor at the end of the row, or just ignore these two and keep on plowing, letting them pass. But I had three good reasons to hold up. Mounted on the gun rack of our turquoise 1966 GMC pickup were my brother's 3030 Marlin rifle, my 22 Western style pistol, and the keys to the ignition were dangling in plain sight. I would be in serious trouble if the truck was stolen. Yet in rural Mississippi, this seemed only a remote possibility. I stopped the tractor at the end of the row and killed the engine. Diesel fumes trailed me as I jumped down and moved toward the truck. Through a heat mirage, I squinted to try to identify the intruders. The two figures came closer scruffy white men in shabby clothes. The smaller of the two waved at me. I declined to return the friendly gesture and continued to watch them. Their feet kicked up dust, each step looking wearier than the last. The small man grinned and waved again, like we were old buddies getting ready to share a beer. The dark-haired man walking beside him didn't speak. Hey, man, you know where the nearest town is at? We've been a-walking all day. The amiable man was a wiry redhead, about five foot six, with a thin face and small, almond-shaped eyes. 
He spoke with a dialect different from any I had ever heard, and his skin was pasty as corn flour. Grenada, two miles south, I replied with a fake nonchalance, a small knot beginning in my stomach. Can't you give us no ride? No, not really. I'm supposed to be working. I reckoned if they had been walking all day, they could just as well walk on to Grenada. In the daily rhythms of our small community, folks knew when something didn't feel right. So I naturally asked myself why these two were crossing our farm. The small man, not to be refused, continued, You got a drink of water? There was insistence in his voice, not the apologetic tone you might expect from an accidental trespasser. I unstrapped the green gallon thermos on the side of the truck and handed it to him. With nimble fingers, he hurriedly unscrewed the plastic top and poured my ice water in it. Then he raised it to his mouth and guzzled greedily. Water sparkled down his chin, dripping onto his white shirt and to the dusty road, making a small mud puddle between his feet. Thirst quenched, he wiped his mouth with the back of his freckled hand, He handed the jug to his partner. Hot day, ain't it? He said. He looked around, surveying the field. Not as hot as it's going to be if you don't get your ass off of our land. That was an internal thought. I didn't say that to I didn't say that to him. Yeah. You sure you can't give us no ride to Grenada? He looked at me closely, sizing up what kind of boy I was and I gave him a quick once-over. He was several inches shorter than I was and appeared to be in his early thirties. His dark-haired partner looked to be about the same. Then something changed, and I knew if I didn't give them a ride, there would be trouble. A strange new energy filled the air, and it had something to do with these disheveled men and the small one's coarse request. I glanced towards the highway and up the field road. I didn't see any help. On most days, there was a good deal of activity in our fields. My older brother, Lee, might be working on a cultivator or planting in the spring, doing one of a thousand things that needed doing around a farm. My dad might come by to check on my progress. Every now and then, my grandfather would bring me a milkshake from Tasty Freeze in Grenada or a soft drink from Giesland's Corner. I never knew when Joe Bailey, who leased our cotton land, might come barreling down the field road at breakneck speed, dust boiling up behind his Datsun truck. But on this day I was alone. No dust clouds on the horizon to signal help coming No grandfather slowly making his way down the field road. No brother Lee working on an implement, nor my father passing through. I would have to deal with these men the best way I could. Okay, whoa. I'm going to stop right there. Uh, You can, you know, if you read Crooked Snake, you'll you'll know how it comes out. Obviously, I'm here, so (laughs) at least you know that much of it, don't you? Um... Okay, I, uh, unless you want me to finish it, I can, I can read the rest of it. It's about another page. Okay, I'll just, I'll go, I've got about five minutes, so I guess I better go ahead and do that. All righty, so, I would have to deal with these men the best way I could. Yeah, okay, I'll give you a ride. Y'all, come on. The men opened the passenger door of my truck and got in. The small, freckled one sat next to me. They both stared straight ahead. I turned the key, and the truck roared to life. We began to weave down the rutted road. I felt the red-haired man's knee bump against mine as he leaned back against the front seat. But just after I shifted to second, 
There was movement to my right. The man acted with cat-like quickness. Through my thin cotton shirt, I felt a blunt jab in my ribs. For a split second, I didn't know what was happening. But then I understood. It was a gun barrel. Before he spoke, I was already pressing the clutch. We're escaped convicts from parchment. Stop the truck and get out. I had never had a gun pulled on me. Only a knife once held my throat, but this was something else. The pistol altered the entire situation. My slightly cocky attitude changed to one of instant compliance. I slid across the wide bench seat, careful not to look closely at him or his partner. I didn't want them to think I'd be able to identify either one of them, give them a reason to shoot me if they needed one. I imagined the bullet would go right through my heart and they would drag me into the field rows where I might not be found for days. I fell out of the truck. I fell out the door of the truck and stumbled to the side of the road, the fiery-haired man right behind me. I could feel the heat from his body as he pressed close, his breath on my neck, the gun rammed into my back. My limbs were rubber. My joints were coming unglued. I could barely stand the sun burning my face. There was nothing but quiet except for the sound of the wind blowing through the beams. Then I heard cars far away on the highway, the scuffle of shoes in the dirt. He shifted the revolver, and from the corner of my eye, I saw the glint of the chrome plating. For the first time, I really looked at him. Burnish, copper hair, standing straight up, deadly eyes. I waited in silence for the gunshot to come and felt the blood drain from my head. Everything became sensory, slow motion. How much time was in a second? Each second moved forward as a gift. One more moment to live. Don't kill him, the dark-haired man said. What's it to you? I don't want no blood on my hands. After what seemed to be an eternity, my captor waved the gun, motioning for me to get back into the truck. I climbed in, having no time to consider my reprieve. Okay. Okay, that's it on my uh, reading. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to do my best to answer them. Hey, Deidre, go ahead. Okay. You write in the book that you were aware that you would be killed, could possibly be killed. Yeah. But after having looked death in the face, did you ever have a period afterwards when you were thinking you were invincible? Thinking that I was invincible? No, I never... I never really thought that uh, other than, you know, when you're young, uh, you're a young boy, you know, a lot of times you probably do things that in hindsight you realize, hey, I could have been killed, you know. So, I, but I never really thought of myself as being invincible. I don't, I don't think I did. Nope. Okay. I, yes, sir. I was just wondering, why is the book called... Crooked snake. Okay, that's a great question. Crooked snake kind of has a double meaning. Albert Leppard grew up in southern Itala County on a creek there, Siniash Creek. And Siniash is a Choctaw word that loosely means crooked snake. So that's the title, Crooked Snake, and obviously it has a double meaning there if you want to apply it to Albert Leppard in his life. So that's, uh, I hope that answers your question. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> uh, thanks for speaking today. Um, I was just wondering, as you uh, reflected on your ordeal, um, what did you uh, learn about yourself? 
whoa, I don't know if I've ever been asked that. What did I learn about myself? I guess I learned that I'm a survivor. That's for sure, because I, I did survive something. And these, uh, Albert Leppard, I had no idea who he was, who either one of these men were. And um, I think I did a pretty good job of handling myself. I know as we were leaving the farm and I was in the middle, and Leopard, who again, I didn't know who he was, had the gun on me. But he, I was bigger than he was. And, you know, when you've grown up on a farm and you've bail hay, you've done all this stuff, and you're 18 years old, you have this idea that you're probably tougher than you could ever possibly be. And I, I had this thought in my head. I was trying to be very, very calm. We were just going down the highway. I could see the tractor disappearing. But you know that feeling when you're on the high dive and you can't quite make yourself do it. And I thought if I could grab that gun and we would wrestle. But I was bigger than him and maybe I could get the door open and we'd both fall out of the door. Well, I had no idea who I was dealing with. And, you know, I've been told by old convicts, other people, that Albert Leopard was the toughest man they ever knew in their life. So he, this fellow next to me who I didn't know he, who he was, that I considered grabbing his gun, I'm really lucky that I never acted on that because they would have made short work of me real quick. So I'm not sure, but you asked though, what was your question again? I'm sorry, I rambled. Well, I guess I learned that uh, I'm capable of keeping a cool head in, in a situation like that. I guess you, I, I could say that's one thing I learned about myself because I'd never, I'd never been in a situation like that before and you don't know what's going to happen. Are you going to fall to the floor screaming like a blithering idiot? Or are you going to sit there and be calm and you're going to try to figure your way out of this? Well, I just tried to be as calm as possible, although my mind was racing, because I didn't know in the next few minutes if I was going to be dead. Uh, so I guess that's what I learned, that I could be, I could keep my wits about me, I suppose. Hopefully that never happens again, though. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. I appreciate you, and um, did you think over and over, like in your dreams or whatever, what you could have done? I mean, different things would come to you over and over, even though you couldn't go back in the past? Huh, well, that's an interesting question. Uh, are there things I think about? Well, yeah, you know, anytime with anybody, when something happens with you, and you respond immediately in a certain way, Maybe somebody says something to you. We've all had that experience. And then you think later, gosh, I should have said this. You know, I could have said this. And so, um, yeah, I think I, I probably, I, I can't consciously remember that, but I think I probably did think back through that. But um, after it all happened, see, I had three high school friends my senior year and we had been planning the entire year to take our senior trip so three weeks after that happened to me on june 22nd we all hit the road we we were just going to do what we had planned and we went to arizona up through grand canyon all the way to canada came back down the west coast um, so I quickly just sort of, I think I just compartmentalized that and didn't just sit around thinking about it because we were, we were on this exciting adventure going out west. Um, so I'm not sure if I answered your question. Are there any other questions? Hey. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Better say ma'am to her. Tell the crowd about the, the man a few years ago. You read a piece of the book, and he said, why didn't you just jump out of the 
Oh, yeah. Okay, <laughs> here's that. way back in 2010, and I, I had a contract on the book, uh, Pelican Publishing out of New Orleans, and, uh, and the Columbus uh, Rotary Club wanted me to come and speak, which I did. I, you know, I kind of explained, I'm not, you know, the book is not out, I'm not, you know, but anyway, I did that. And uh, so after I did my reading, and, uh, and there were questions, uh, an elderly gentleman said, well, why didn't, you just, why didn't you just run around the truck, you know, and run, on, and run off? And I thought, well, you know, that's easy to say. You have a gun on you. What are you going to do there? Anyway, they told me later, they told me later oh, that's just old so-and-so. He always asks those kinds of questions. <laughs> <laughs> and apologize. Uh, so, um, are there any other questions? Could you say a few words about, you had mentioned that he was uh, a frequent escapee from Parchment. Can you say a few words about some of his Yeah, escapes? Leopard escaped from Parchment in 61, 62, 63, 64, 68, and 73. He escaped more than any other prisoner at Parchman. He was considered an escape artist. And uh, he led authorities on some real dramatic manhunts. And so, and I said this at the very first, what I was able to do in all my interviews, I was able to talk with people who had been tied up, they had been robbed, one other fella had been kidnapped. They all had stories, and it was the biggest story of their life. No one had ever asked them about this. So they were able to tell me their story. Then I wondered, could any of these law officers still be alive from the, the early 60s and late 50s? And so I, I found some of them who were on the manhunts, and they could tell me their side of it. And then I was even more difficult to find I found some of the old convicts who had escaped with Albert Leopard, and they could tell me their side. So it's more or less a holistic telling from these different uh, these different people, and uh, whatever their their uh, you know whatever they they did. Um, I didn't you know a lot of these old convicts had served um, time for murder double murder, they'd done some pretty bad things. And, you know, numerous, most of them told me the crimes they had committed. But I wasn't really interested in writing a gratuitous book about those things at all. I just mentioned that they were serving time for murder and, uh, and just move on. Just kind of kept the ball, the focus on Albert Leopard. Um, but he escaped all those, those times uh, until you know, his last escape, and then he didn't escape anymore. And you'll just have to read the book to know how all that turns out. Uh, I did, I will say one other thing. Yeah, I know the time is up, but I think I've got one more minute. So, uh, Albert Leopard wasn't alone when he committed that murder of his great aunt. His first cousin, Joe Edwards, was with him that day, and they both had a hand in murdering Mary Young. And uh, they were both sentenced to life at Parchman. And I don't know how the law works today, but in that day, if you served 10 years of a life term, you could be eligible for parole. Joe did what they call good time. He was a model prisoner. And so he was paroled after 10 years. Of course, Albert escaped all those times. He could never be considered a model prisoner. And then they also, I don't, they, they added extra time to his sentence because of all the crimes that he committed on escape. So Joe, um, Joe became a Pentecostal preacher <laughs> after he got out of Parchman. And I caught up with Joe. Uh, he heard 
that I was writing, I told him I was writing a story about Albert. He heard, you know, he had heard through family, through the grapevine. At the time, he lived in South Louisiana. Um, he wanted to meet me. So we met, and uh, I talked with Joe. I, I won't say how all that kind of comes out, but, but uh, you know, all of these characters play a role in the book, and there are lots of characters. And I list them all in the back of the book, and that if, if, you're, if you happen to read the book, because, uh, you know, some people have read the book, and they didn't discover until the very end that all this was in the back back there, and they were having trouble keeping up with all these people. Um, but anyway, back to what you, you said, those six escapes, and they, um, you know, his first escape, he escaped solo. His second escape, he escaped with three convicts down in the swamp. There was a huge manhunt around Benoit, and uh, he was captured. His third escape in 63, he escaped with three convicts, made it all the way to Tijuana, Mexico, and uh, parts in between, all up in Michigan and all, all that. Um, his fourth escape uh, was the cotton field. He escaped with four convicts, and there was a big shootout with a, with a posse. And two of the convicts were killed, and he was captured. And, uh, of course, his fifth escape was when he and John Parker crossed uh, our farm on escape. And uh, his last escape, he escaped alone. And uh, so I won't, I won't tell you about all of that, but... Chris, thank you so well, much. Yeah. I, I really appreciate it. Yeah. There are no more copies questions. Of the book. We have copies of the book. We're a little short-staffed in the store today, so instead of having them for sale at the front of the room, you're going to have to run right over here to the store to pick up copies. But Lovejoy will be happy to sign them back over here. Thank you all for coming. I hope we see you back next Wednesday. Thank you all.